Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review, or at least making a start on a review, of Five Plays by Anton Chekhov. So this is the Oxford World's Classics Edition. Uh, it includes Ivanov, The Seagull, Uncle Vanya, Three Sisters and The Cherry Orchard. Translated with an introduction by Ronald Hindley. I will read you the blurb, we're going to go through and check out my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... The five plays on which Chekhov's worldwide reputation rests defy attempts to determine what they are about. Some productions of Chekhov exude an atmosphere of unrelieved gloom. Others turn into a boisterous romp around the samovar. Are they tragedies of loss and dispossession, or light-hearted send-ups of society's misfits? Chekhov does not answer such questions. Instead, he involves us in the emotional experience of his characters as they seek for a pattern and meaning in their lives. The grand design eludes them, but what they have left, their everyday existence, their unspectacular victories and unheroic disappointments, can seem somehow within the confines of the Chekhov play to matter at least as much. This collection of five great plays is taken from the Oxford Chekhov, Ronald Hingley's scholarly edition, acclaimed for the accuracy and the speakability of the translations. So, uh, I didn't have anything out in the introduction, I actually read that as a bedtime book, because it was pretty heavy going, to be honest. So, um, I read the introduction, sort of, over the course of a couple of nights, and we're now going to move on to Ivanov, um, which was probably my favourite of the plays in the collection, actually. So we get somebody who goes, uh, you know, old boy, I've done over 10 miles in about three hours and I'm dead beat. You feel my heart. And Ivanov is reading. He says, very well, in a minute. And Borkin says, no, do it now. He takes Ivanov's hand and puts it to his chest. Well, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Something wrong with the old ticker. I might drop dead any moment. I say, would you care if I did? And Ivanov says, I'm reading. Won't it keep? I think we can all relate to that. And Anna says, um, if you want women to like you, never let them see you being annoyed or stuffy. I'll bear that in mind. Thank you for the advice, Anna. And then Ivanov gets this very questionable line. He says, you only left college last year, my dear Lvov, and you're still young and full of life, but I'm 35. I have the right to advise you. Don't you go marrying Jewesses, neurotics or blue stockings, but choose something nice and drab and ordinary. A little bit anti-Semitic there, uh, Ivanov, old pal. Oh boy. And Mrs. Babakin says, one doesn't yawn in front of ladies, surely. And if that is the case, I have been very rude to people because I, I yawn all the time. I'm a very tired person. And when uh, Lebedev sees Mrs. Babakin, he goes, heavens, there's sugar and spice and all things nice. And all I could think of uh, was the Powerpuff Girls. And then Lebedev talking about alcohol, he says, drinking, there's nothing to it. Even a horse can drink. No, the thing is to drink properly. Now, in our time, you'd sweat away at your lectures all day long. Then you'd make for the bright lights in the evening and buzz around till crack of dawn. You'd dance and amuse the girls and there'd be a bit of this business. He pretends to drink. Sometimes you'd jabber away 19 to the dozen, but young men these days... I can't make them out. They're no use to man or beast. There's only one decent young fellow in the whole country and he's married. And I think he's going a bit off his head. And even though he tells this story of, uh, I guess, like an overconfident young man, he says, I had a man working here called Simon, remember? When we were threshing once, he wanted to show the girls how strong he was, so he heaved two sacks of rye on his back and broke under the strain. He died soon after. And then Sasha gets a great little soliloquy here that I want to read out. She says, there's a great deal men don't understand. Any girl prefers a failure to a success because we're all fascinated by the idea of love in action. Active love, don't you see? Men are busy with their work and love's very much in the background for them. You talk to your wife, stroll around the garden with her, pass the time of day nicely and have a little cry on her grave and that's that. But love is our whole existence. I love you and that means I long to cure your unhappiness and go with you to the ends of the earth. If you go up in the world, I'll be with you, and if you fall by the wayside, I'll fall too. For instance, I'd love to spend all night copying your papers or watching to see that no one woke you up. Or I'd walk a hundred miles with you. I remember once about three years ago at threshing time. You came to see us covered with dust, sunburned, tired out, and asked for a drink. By the time I brought you a glass, you were lying on the sofa, dead to the world. You slept about 12 hours in our house, and I stood guard at the door all the time to stop anyone going in. And I felt so marvellous. The more effort you put into love, the better it is. I mean, the more strongly it's felt. Do you see? I think that's quite interesting, this idea of active love. That's how I fall in love. Borkin gets a great line as well. He walks into a room and goes, What a vision of delight! I came looking for prose and walked slap into poetry. And uh, even if he gets this line, uh, well, this little mini, this paragraph, I suppose, um, which I think is fairly accurate, to be honest. Once an intelligent, educated, healthy man begins feeling sorry for himself for no obvious reason and starts rolling down the slippery slope, he rolls on and on without stopping and nothing can save him. Well, where is the hope for me? 
What could it be? I can't drink. Spirits make my headache. I can't write bad verse, nor can I worship my own mental laziness and put it on a pedestal. Laziness is laziness. Weakness is weakness. I can't find other names for them. I'm done for, I tell you. There's no more to be said. We might be interrupted. Listen, if you love me, help me. You must break off the marriage without delay this very instant. Hurry up. And we get this line. Treplev says, your hair and beard are a mess. Shouldn't you get a trim? And Sora, and he combs his beard and he goes, it's the bane of my life. As a young man, I always looked as if I had a hangover and so on. Women never liked me. Yeah, that's, that's me as well. <laughs> but at least having a beard helps to dis disguise the fact that I still look like I have a hangover, even if I don't have a beard. And that's also remind reminded me of the comment, a very nice comment I got on YouTube the other day from someone who just said, what was it, you look so unhealthy. And then I replied saying, at least I haven't died yet. And they were like, that's not the point, go to your GP. My GP doesn't like seeing me because they used to see me all the time because I have a uh, chronic health condition, so you know. Great line here. When people can't think what to say, they always hold forth about the young. It's very true even today as well, those bloody Gen Zers. Okay, and then, so the, the main character in this is a writer and he gets this great little soliloquy here. So Nina says, your life's marvellous. What's so nice about it? I must go and write now. Sorry, I'm busy. You've done what's called treading on my favourite chord and now I'm getting excited and a bit annoyed. Anyway, let me have my say. Let's talk about my wonderful, brilliant life. Right, where can we start? Some people have obsessions and can't help thinking day and night about something like the moon. Well, I'm a bit moonstruck too, haunted day and night by this writing obsession. I must write, I must. Hardly have I ended one story when I somehow have to tackle another, then a third and fourth on top of that. I'm always writing, never stop, can't help it. What's wonderful and brilliant about that, eh? It's such a barbarous life. Here am I talking to you and getting quite excited, yet can't forget for a second that I have an unfinished novel waiting for me. Or I see a cloud over there like a grand piano. So I think it must go in a story, a cloud like a grand piano sailed past. Or I smell heliotrope and make a quick mental note, sickly scent, flower, sombre hue, mention description of summer evening. I try to catch every sentence, every word you and I say, and quickly lock all these sentences and words away in my literary storehouse because they might come in handy. When I finish work, I rush off to the theatre or go fishing. That would be the time to relax and forget, but not a bit of it. I already have another great weight on my mind, a new plot. I feel I must go to my desk, hurry up and start writing, writing, writing all over again. This sort of thing goes on all the time. I can never relax, and I feel I'm wasting my life. I feel I'm taking pollen from my best flowers, tearing them up and stamping on the roots, all to make honey that goes to some vague, distant destination. I'm mad. I must be. Well, my friends and acquaintances don't exactly treat me as sane, do they? What are you writing now? What have you got in store for us? They keep on and on and on, and to me it's all so bogus. My friends' attention, praise and admiration. They deceive me the way one does an invalid, and I'm sometimes afraid they're just waiting to creep up, grab me and cart me off to an asylum like the lunatic and goggle. And in my young days, in my best years, when I was just beginning, this writing business was sheer agony. An obscure author feels clumsy, awkward, out of place, especially when things aren't going well. He's all on edge with nervous strain. He can't help hanging around literary and artistic people, unrecognised, unnoticed, afraid to look anyone in the face. He's like a gambling addict who has no money. I never saw any of my readers, but I somehow thought of them as hostile and sceptical. I was afraid of the public, scared stiff. When I put on a new play, I always felt the dark-haired people in the audience were against me, while the fair-haired ones didn't care either way. Isn't it awful? What agony it was. So if you're a writer, you can probably relate to that little bit there. We get a reference to the riddle. What walks on four legs in the morning, on two legs at noon, and on three legs in the evening? And then Soren laughs and says, yes, I know, and spends the night on its back. Uh, that is man, by the way, in case you were unaware of that. I think it was in The Hobbit, so you're probably aware of that. We get some French dotted about some of these plays as well, so here we have a... Uh, a plot for a novel. It ought to be called The Man Who Wanted, Lom Ki Avulu. And now uh, we get a reference to an epidemic, which I just thought was interesting given that we are in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. So Marina says, would you care for something to eat? And Astrov says, no, thank you. A few weeks before Easter, I went to Malitskoy. They had an epidemic there, typhus. There were village people lying around all over the place in their huts. Filth, stench, smoke everywhere and calves on the floor mixed up with patients. Little pigs as well. I was on the go all day, didn't so much as sit down or have a bite to eat, and even when I got home there was no rest for me. They brought someone in from the railway, a switchman. I got him on the table to operate, and damned if he didn't have to die on me under chloroform. Then just at the worst possible moment my feelings did come to life and I felt as guilty as if I'd murdered the man. I sat down and closed my eyes like this. And I thought of the men and women who will be alive a hundred or a couple of hundred years after we've gone, those we're preparing the way for. Will they have a good word to say for us? You know, Nanny, they won't even remember us. 
Marina says, men may forget, but God will remember. Thank you for saying that, you put it very well. Unless you don't believe in God, in which case you just think that life is futile and pointless. And we get this little bit between Sonia and Astrov. So Sonia says, don't be like that, please. You're always saying that man doesn't create anything, that he only destroys what God has given him. Then why, oh why, destroy your own self? Don't do it, don't do it, I beg you, I implore you. Astrov says, I'll stop drinking them. Give me your word. My word of honour. Thank you. Right, that's settled. Now I'm sober. Yes, as you see, I'm now quite sober and sober I shall remain till the end of my days. Um, which I just sort of thought was interesting because I recently did my uh, year of not drinking. That was from Uncle Vanya, by the way. That was the only thing I tabbed out in Uncle Vanya. Uh, we are now moving on to three sisters. So Tuzenbach is talking about somebody and he said uh, his, his wife tries to commit suicide every so often, obviously just to annoy her husband. Obviously, yes. And Solini says, uh, when a man starts philosophizing, that's what's termed philosophistics, or just plain sophistics. But when a woman or a couple of women start doing it, then it's just a case of them talking through their hats. Yes, very enlightened viewpoint there. Oh, and they talk about um, this guy who plays violin and is in love, and they talk about calling him the lovesick fiddler. And for me, <laughs> that just made me think of Prince Andrew. Oh dear. And Andrew said that his uh, father taught him and his sister some languages. So he says, uh, thanks to father, my sisters and I know French, German and English, and Irina knows Italian too. But what an effort. And Masha says, knowing three languages is a useless luxury in this town. It's not even a luxury, but a sort of unwanted appendage, like having a sixth finger. We know too much. And at the start of act two, I was a bit confused because it says it's eight o'clock in the evening in the description. And then uh, the fourth line of dialogue is someone checking their watch and saying it's a quarter past eight. And I'm like, how have you managed to think that that dialogue would take 15 minutes. Get an interesting line here. Um, My kingdom for a glass of tea. I've had nothing since breakfast. And um, that's obviously a, re a reference to Richard III. And I'm a big fan of um, uh, lines that kind of parody that My kingdom for a horse line. There's a, on my arm I have, which arm is it? This arm, My kingdom for a kiss upon her shoulder, which is a Jeff Buckley line. Um, so yeah, I just like parodies of that line. And then Culligan gets this um, line, uh, he's talking to the doctor who's drunk, he goes, thoroughly plastered, aren't you, doctor? Well done, my boy, in vino veritas, as the ancients used to say, which means in wine there is truth. And um, I used to know a poet on YouTube called Vino Venitas. I'm, I'm not sure what the Venitas means. And Arena, later on, she goes, I can't remember the Italian for window or ceiling either. I'm always forgetting things. I forget something every day. And I was just thinking when I was reading that, she needs Charlie Heathcote. Charlie, if you're watching, leave in the comments the Italian for window and ceiling. <laughs> this line did make me laugh here. Uh, Culligan, he goes, a schoolmaster once wrote Buncombe on a pupil's essay, and the boy thought it was Latin and started declining it. Buncombe, 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 Bunky, Bunco, Bunco. I guess declining it means the same as conjugating it. And then Andrew gets this great soliloquy about the town that he lives in. He goes, where is my past life? Oh, what has become of it? When I was young, happy and intelligent, when I had such glorious thoughts and visions and my present and future seemed so bright and promising. Why is it we've hardly started living before we all become dull, drab, boring, lazy, complacent, useless and miserable? This town's 200 years old and we've 100,000 people living here, but the trouble is, every man jack of them is exactly like every other one, and no one here does anything really worthwhile, or ever has. We've never produced a single scholar or artist or anyone else with a touch of originality to make us envy him, or decide we were damn well going to go one better ourselves. All these people do is eat, drink and sleep till they drop down dead. Then new ones are born to carry on the eating, drinking and sleeping. And to save themselves getting bored to tears and put a bit of spice in their lives, they go in for all this sickening gossip, vodka, gambling, litigation. Wives deceive their husbands and husbands tell lies and pretend they're deaf and blind to what's going on. And all the time the children are crushed by vulgarity, lose any spark of inspiration they might ever have had and, like their fathers and mothers before them, turn into a lot of miserable living corpses, each one exactly like his neighbour. Then we get a bit more French, so we get, uh, Il ne faut pas faire de bruit, la Sophie est dormée déjà. Vous êtes en earth. Uh, and that means uh, one mustn't make noise. Uh, the Sophie <laughs> is already sleeping or still sleeping. Uh, you are a bear. So now I'm going to start calling people bears when they're noisy. So moving on to the cherry orchard. So Lofferkin gets uh, the line, Amelia, get thee to a nunnery, which I believe is from Shakespeare. And uh, Mrs. Renevsky keeps calling people my precious. And obviously that just made me think of Gollum. 
So yeah, the fireplace in this, uh, even of was by far my favorite, probably then followed by the seagull, then the three sisters, then the cherry orchard, then Uncle Vanya, which is a surprise to me because Uncle Vanya is like the most well-known one. Uh, of the plays, I would give Ivanov a four out of five. The rest were a 3.5 out of five. Overall, I gave the book a weak four out of five, but did enjoy it. And uh, if you're curious, definitely check out some Chekhov. I'd love to see some of these performed, especially as I say Ivanov. Um, Probably all the seagull, either of those I'd, I'd particularly like to go and see. The other thing I should mention about Chekhov as well is he got the uh, balance just right between some of its humorous, almost like farcical and not quite slapstick, but getting there. And then other bits of it, it's just like super dark. There's a lot of like references to suicide. Also, nobody's happy where they live. They all want to go and live in Moscow. Uh, this is like a common theme throughout all the plays. I actually think I might have got more from the plays if I'd read them separately as opposed to going straight from one into another, you know? Um, but yeah. I did enjoy it and I would recommend checking it out. So there we have it, that's what I made of five plays by Anton Chekhov. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book or if you've read or seen any of the plays. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.